Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Okay, welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy <coughs> Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. This is episode 141 now, Bob. 141? 141, if my calculations are correct. Gosh. Yeah. Social it's, calculations are correct, then. Hopefully. It's the day after Valentine's Day as well. Not sure whether you did anything wonderful with your dear wife. Well, I better not go down that path. But, <laughs> but we'll not put you on the spot. So <laughs> the topic of this one, following on from the last podcast quite nicely, is the importance for the therapist to think developmentally in the therapy process. OK, so let's do a brief history of psychotherapy Oh, let's let's do a brief history, very brief, from Freud to where we are today. Yes. Let's put this whole in context. So if we go back 120, 30 years ago, let's say Freud was a psychologist, you know, the father of some of this sort of psychological stuff today. So we have the early psychoanalysts, 1888, you know, uh, 19, you know, 1901, 1930 1940 so that was where you know psychoanalysis was sort of created as a model to deal with you know mental health and that was all about creating awarenesses you know that the, the cure was that the client became more aware um, yeah. and it's very much a one up one down process contracts were unilateral not bilateral and psychoanalysis major methodology for cure was really free association, free association um, and interpretation by the analyst. Yeah. The aim of furthering awareness, which would lead to cure in the mental health framework we're talking about. Then psychotherapy started to come along and we had the birth of different types of psychotherapy whether it be um, some of the ego psychotherapists, whether it be some of the drama therapists, gestalt psychotherapists, the early self-psychologists, psychodynamic psychotherapy, existential psychotherapy, transaction analysis. Many of the different humanistic psychotherapies came along in the 40s, 50s and 60s. Psychodynamic, psychodynamic psychotherapy which came off the birth of psychoanalysis, still running along. And we had a lot of creations of self-psychologists. And then probably, you know, 1991, two, three, we had the uh, relational turn, turn and the birth of relational psychotherapies and the idea that the relationship is the major curative factor. And here we are up to date. Alongside that, we had the, I think, the governmental-led CBT cre creation of therapies where, um, you know, cognitive and behavioural changes were the order of the day, uh, much more quicker in terms of sessions uh, uh, leading to so-called cure than a lot of these longer type of humanistic psychotherapies. So CBT became the vogue of the day in the NHS um, and the NHS, which is very funded by governmental processes and money uh, and government's uh, research, for example, um, was, trying, was still going along, but you still have the creation of a lot of these other types of psychotherapies. Okay. So depending when you trained, where you were influenced, usually meant the type of psychotherapist you'd become. So in all this I've just talked about here, um, there is a type of therapy that I 
put myself down for, or I would call myself, and that would be a developmental relational integrative psychotherapist. Okay. Now, um, informed by a lot of transaction analysis theory or practice or and practice. Because you can have TA, which is not developmental. In other words, if you look at early, sorry, developmentally focused, uh, Eric Burns' early TA was adult focused. And what I mean by that was strengthening the adult was the order of the day in terms of cure for the earlier Eric Byrne transaction analysts, not uh, a developmental focus. And what I mean by developmental focus is a therapist that thinks primarily that what happens in a person's past informs the present. Okay. So what happens in the person's past, their developmental deficits, their unmet relational needs, their trauma informs how they are today. So a CBT therapist would not be thinking that way. They'd be much more interested in the here and now, and they wouldn't yeah. think they wouldn't be thinking developmentally. No. The early transaction analysts would not be thinking developmentally. Um, a lot of counseling frameworks would not be thinking developmentally. They would be much more in the here and now. Um, I find that really hard to comprehend. <laughs> well, it depends. And as for the counselors maybe listening to you, I better be a bit more specific because I don't want to be unfair to them. And it, yeah. So it depends where you're trained. Yeah. You were talking about the counselling world. If you're trained as a therapeutic counsellor, you'd certainly be thinking about how the past affected the present. And many of the long, you know, the, the, the four or five year training courses in counselling would certainly be thinking about how the past, you know, how the the past affects the present and how the developmental stages that the person goes through from infant, infanthood, yeah, to where they are today, um, affects them. They may certainly be thinking that way. However, in the actual practice of the counselling, they may not be proactive in helping the person move back into the past. Okay. So when you say move back into the past to work out where all this stuff comes from, the life script and the decisions that they made and how that impacts on them in the here and now. Yeah, and, you, and to use methods like inquiry, attunement, involvement to help the person to go into their child ego state. Yeah. With a lot of the counselling methodologies, it's much more about staying in the present moment moment and going where the client goes rather than leading the client somewhere yeah <clears throat> see that doesn't mean they don't think developmentally but the training of counselors there's so many different types of training of counselors and psychotherapists may not include that focus yes yeah because a lot of it is um solution focused as in this is the problem what do we do to stop it going forward rather than where does it come from and what can we do to to work that part out yeah, a lot of a lot of counseling and maybe a lot of psychotherapy models by the way is solo is solution focused yeah and often six to ten sessions or ten to twelve sessions or twelve to twenty four sessions maybe yeah but specifically like the way you've just explained it and for some people that six to eight sessions or whatever is all that they're willing or happy to commit to oh yes yes this isn't this isn't i don't want you to hear that i'm differentiating which is the most suitable for um 
you know, clients because I believe in contracts and bilateral contacts. And for some people, um, they don't want to go back to their different developmental stages. They yeah yeah they're in the here and now and concentrate on just one particular thing and seeing that by changing thinking sort of behaviours, then they can get to their outcome that way and they might well do yes yes yeah but for me long-term change is knowing all that stuff about why we are the way that we are why we do what we do and all that sort of stuff whereas solution focus for me you don't really need to know all that stuff just how to stop it going forward that's the so so do you so given what you have just said about the way you think about psychotherapy, then you are developmentally focused. Yes. Yes, I am. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I am. And I, I like that because it makes sense to me. Yeah, it's certainly not a criticism. It's more, I just wanted to say we're on the f- same, same page. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I, I like a lot and you know it goes back to my yeah I'm a, a nursery nurse that was the, you know one of the first proper jobs that I had apart from being a hairdresser and then a foster carer is Pam Levin's ages and stages and the different developmental things that we go through I like a process like that you know that we do go through these individuation and separation stages and if there's a disruption at that point, then that impacts on how we attach to people and our relationships and everything. That just makes sense to me. So we could both call ourselves developmental therapists and there's a difference between me and you, I think. And okay. again, I really don't want you to hear a differentiation here. I would rather just hear style or, or, or way I think about, you know. And the difference is, I think, and you can say I'm completely wrong. <laughs> I'm quite happy. <laughs> I but wouldn't I, say that, Bob. I think the difference is, is th- like you've just explained, you think about script analysis, you think about the different stages of power uh, that you've just talked about. You did think of the developmental stages that impact people from infant to adulthood. And you think about a lot of these things and your therapy this is where I may be wrong, seems more cognitively based than I probably focus on. So you sounds like you think about building up, um, how can I call it, more psychoeducation. So you teach them their script or teach them their drivers or teach them how to X, 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 X. But I don't think it's your style to go back through, say, supported regressions back to a younger child ego stayed get them talking to their projections i agree yes so i'm somebody who works proactively back in a different time zone yes yeah yeah and i get that and i think for me the reason is lack of confidence i would hazard a guess yes yeah, so, but you may decide that's why I, yeah okay okay so now yeah, okay. I was thinking about not differentiating about different ways of doing things because that the way that you're talking about and the way that you work can be as successful as the way I work. I'd like to think so. <laughs> they lack of confidence probably because it may be like confidence, I don't know, Jackie, but it might also be because um, you get the results you get without doing that maybe yeah and I am very logical as we know Bob I like a structure to follow so you know for me I do follow a structure well it's a different type of structure though isn't it because I think I have a structure but my structure is perhaps it did do the confidence I don't know my structure is much more about going back and helping them be their younger selves and empower themselves and making more decisions. And then, you know, they change ego states, if you like, and are able to 
integrate those decisions. So I suppose, oh, I think it might be a philosophical difference then. I suppose where it all comes down to me is that I think that in their younger child ego states, they make decisions about themselves other than the world, which isn't helpful for them. It helps them survive at the time. Yeah. Help themselves now. So you need to make the changes back then when the trauma or the dysfunction happened. And if it's changed back there, then they can start integrating it in the present. But they need to go back there, first of all, to change it. Yeah, I think that's that's the bit. Yeah, for me, I stop at that point. <laughs> I don't go back there. For me, it's about having the awareness that that's where it occurred yeah. and what decision yeah. it was rather than actually going back there. Yeah, yeah. So my the bit of therapy I'm talking about, that was not bit, the way I work, takes a very long time. Yes, yes, quite right. Yeah. A long, long time with me. Yeah. Uh, the, the dangers are for that type of therapy I'm talking about. Uh, if people were to critique me, they would say one of the dangers could be or that the person stays infantilized and repeats history and never moves on. Or uh, I, the therapist can keep them young if you like yeah so they, so they become in quotes dependent on the therapist rather than developing a sense of autonomy if i had to critique yes yeah yeah uh, way of working which i think it's always good to to critique what we do and reassess it and look at all those things because i, I suppose i i can think of some clients that working developmentally the way that you're talking about would work for them but I also think that there's other clients that wouldn't enjoy the experience it would be quite alienating for them well I, I, I'm, I the word enjoy isn't something I think many clients <laughs> I'd like to think my clients have an enjoyable uh, experience <laughs> going back to their world of trauma isn't necessarily well but it may be it may be you know i think it takes a lot of courage and a lot of guts to be able to go back to the yeah yeah uh, world of trauma yes absolutely you have, really, you have to really trust the therapist and feel yeah. good by the therapist uh all those those ways you're talking about so i think there's different styles of different focuses when we call ourselves developmental therapists yeah develop my sort of focus on developmental therapy if you like is to go back into time to where the decisions were first made and all what i've just explained yes whereas yours is more helping them be more aware from a here and now place yes even though you still think developmentally yeah yeah, and now that impacts on everything. You know, the the you know going back to what I was saying before about do you know what I mean? The disruption at a certain age or whatever plays out in relationships. Yes, yes. I yes, think yes. you know relationships play out the same sort of script stuff as our life to a certain extent. You know, when when we become comfortable in a relationship, that's quite healthy for some people. Whereas for other people, that can be seen as abandonment <laughs> when they're not paying us enough attention mm -hmm. so the key thing is that we both think developmentally though they our style or our process may be different yeah so we both you know think developmentally which is very different from say a cognitive behavioral therapist who won't go and won't think about someone's history as much yeah. They'll be thinking about cognitive behavioural change in the here and now. Yeah. For example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, probably going off track here, but do you think that we as therapists are the way that we are because of our past and our upbringing as well? Oh, I don't think we can escape from that truism. 
that even if you know we, we're trained at the same place and we go through the same training and we do all the same stuff that we are unique as therapists and will veer towards one way rather than the other i think our histories play far more a part in this than the training yeah i think and i don't i'm not don't want to discount the training as or discount the importance of the training or discount the influence of the training, of course, because I was influenced slightly by all my training as a psychotherapy. I've been influenced by mine, Bob. <laughs> yeah. But how we what we take from the trainings, yeah. How we subconsciously or consciously respond to the information of the trainings is the different is the difference. Yes. Yeah. But, you know. It's just too too small a time in this podcast to suddenly start thinking about, you know, the, what, what I took from the training. But, you know, I've always, you know, people, and I've always said this, I think, that the wounded part of myself as a child, I started to heal through my own training. Yes, yeah. So the type of therapist I had was a developmentally focused therapist, which would go back in history, just like I talked about. Yeah. So I think the therapist, I might say, which I had to have for four years, which I carried on for many, many years after that, by the way, probably influenced me more than the training. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think mine probably did as well. Because that they they then become that influential positive part of our backstory, if you will, don't they? And I also think it was a very 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 long time. Perhaps I'm just a slow learner, but anyway, a very very long time before the the information from the training made much sense to me. Mm. In other words, what I mean, I had to do the therapy first mm. to allow my wounds from my younger self to be healed, to grasp enough adult in the here and now to um, have the autonomy, I think, to take in some of the information from the training. I think that's a really valid point, Bob. Absolutely. And, you know, I I was probably the same you know, I, I would think I'd got it and I'd understood it and then there'd be another level and it was like, no, I don't understand this at all. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. even now, I, th I, I think I'm continually learning about scripts and how they are quite manipulative in a way, do you know what I mean? And the, the secretive and everything, and, and do we ever truly know them? I don't know. Uh, I think, though, uh, if we take a definition of a script as a life plan, an unconscious life plan learnt in history as a way of surviving, then, then, the, then in essence, there's survival coping plans. Yeah. And out of necessity, they worked, whether it was in a maladaptive way or not, they worked. Absolutely, the yeah. Survived. They may well become outdated, and that's why the client comes to you in the first place, no, because they feel that perhaps there's just something wrong, or they've got a level of discomfort, and it's been going on such a long time, they want to change things. And that might mean changing or updating those coping survival scripts. And that's why they come to you. But you see, for you to be thinking that way, it means you're thinking developmentally. Because the scripts of created to deal with the developmental deficits. Yeah. So for you to be thinking about scripts, by definition, you are thinking developmentally. Good. I'm pleased about that. <laughs> <laughs> we both come to the same conclusion there. Yeah. Yeah. And it just fascinates me every day something happens with a client that fascinates me how 
how we do that as a survival mechanism, how we, you know, the decisions that we make, we make them for whatever reason, and we still act on them today. It fascinates me. Well, we, we, we do them to survive. We're very, you know, children are very resilient. Yeah. They, 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 they create ways of being and thinking to survive the best they can. Yeah. And that will continue, I think, until the discomfort of the creative scripts that we developed um, or the discomfort from them because, because of the new situation uh, in the present, um, then the people might come to therapy. But also can, many people don't come to therapy. So they carry on in these scripts, the ways of thinking, feeling, behaving, and surrounding themselves with people fit into those same thought patterns and may carry on that way and never go to therapy. It's only when the script becomes, you know, a bit creaky or a bit leaky or they come to a place where the hurt is too difficult to imagine and they want to enhance their lives that they might don't come to therapy. Yeah. And the next stage, of course, which you will help them with, or I would help them with, which is to help them, A, be aware of all this, which is really the biggest step, I yeah. think. So I think psychoanalysis had it right to a certain extent. And the second part, which wasn't really developed until psychotherapy came along, which, which is how to integrate the new script into their life today. Yeah. And enhance their life and take ownership of their own destiny. Yeah, that's the biggie, is to take ownership of how they're living their life now. Yeah, yeah. It only come with awareness, can't it? Yes, I talk about that all the time. Awareness is key to me. So that's what the early psychoanalysts, and that's what Freud thought. Okay, it's methods, interpretation, everything else. But he died unhappy because he's realised, I think, that the next stage had to be completed after awareness and that's where psychotherapy came along yeah they completed, started to complete the second stage and thank goodness they did because where would we all be then bob <laughs> yeah, well, all i think about in the early stages and the psychoanalytic stuff and freud and all that is you know that a lot of it was aimed at women being you know mental <laughs> i think there's a lot of you know things which were badly wrong in those days and there were some fundamental aspects which thank goodness they were least challenged by those early um psychological people in other words to think of different difficulties well however you, so you're quite right in what you've just said but to at least start thinking about the mind and the brain being an important thing to start considering leading to mental health problems it's massively massively different from what was before that yeah i see you've got me on you get me on another topic now which is the, the mind body connection and how do you know what I mean? Mental health impacts on us physically is is a, a, an area that I am becoming increasingly interested in. Um, but yeah, I think women were just seen as, you know, being histrionic and everything else, you know. And looking back on it, was that just the menopause and all the things that women tend to go through that were causing those responses? Yeah. Well, you look at, if you look at the period, 1876, 1880, and Think of the context of culture and yeah, it's sort of that whole framework fits into the culture of the day. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I'm so pleased that I was born when I was Bob. Well, we were born, <laughs> we were born in the golden era, really. Yes, yes. Long way to go in many fields, but you know, compared to the rest, lot of areas in history. Um, we haven't had it too bad, especially when we think of what's coming. Now, that's a bit more, yeah, different. Yeah. 
Yeah, we'll not go there. Thank you so much. Especially yeah. not after Valentine's Day. Not after Valentine's Day. We <laughs> want to keep it upbeat and hope that yeah, everybody yeah. had a wonderful yeah. evening, whether it was showing love to somebody else or love to themselves, which I think yeah, is just it, as important. Yeah, and of course, love is one of the major prerequisites in a successful psychotherapy procedure. Yes. Yes, self-love. I talk about it all the time. Um, so what we're going to be looking at next time, Bob, is the unique self in the therapy process. And what's the sec Oh, yeah, the unique self. The unique well, self. That would be really interesting. I don't know what made me pick that title, but I must have had some thought process all those months ago. But well, I'll enjoy talking about that. Because I think, really, I mean, I think the, podcast will, the podcast will be about are we ever our unique self in the psychotherapy process or in life generally? But let's leave that till next week. Oh, so you're talking about authenticity. In, <laughs> in the real self, yes. Right, okie dokie, as a, until as next opposed, time. As opposed to the false self. Yeah, which we like to show quite a lot. <laughs> okie dokie, I'll speak to you soon, Bob. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Bye. -bye, bye, -bye. bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>